So we are coming to uh, the last, but certainly not the least speaker of the day. I am very happy to introduce him to you and uh, know that you'll find his talk very interesting. Uh, Dr. Heis Gibson is a senior lecturer in the Technology and Operations Management Unit at the Harvard Business School. We won't hold that against him, seeing that our <laughs> rivals here at Cornell. Um, prior to that, uh, Heiss is actually a graduate of West Point, where he was a member of the Division 1A Army football team. He was commissioned in the U.S. Army as an aviation officer in the UH-60 Black Cop helicopter. Suffice to say, he's kind of a badass, but, you know, we'll keep that going. He served with distinction in various command and staff positions for over 25 years, earning the rank of colonel before he retired in 2021. Until July of 2021, uh, Colonel Gibson served as an academy professor in the uh, systems engineering department at United States Military Academy, where we've had the fortune to interact with him and teach. He also established and directed the Systems Decisions and Analysis Center as well as directed the department's core engineering sequence and engaged in strategic outreach as a fellow at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory. Heiss earned his Doctorate of Business Administration from <laughs> Harvard University in Technology and Operations Management. Professor Gibson's research and consulting activities have been in the areas of technology integration, operational effectiveness, leadership, leader development, human capital development, change management, and leading teams through crisis. So I am honored to have him join us today and even more honored to call him a friend. So without further delay, hi, Skipson. That, that's a lot. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and thanks, Derek, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Can I share my screen? I hope I can. Let's see here. Let's knock this out. There you go. And let's make sure this, this goes well. Give me a high sign. Got a slot. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Derek. OK. Let, let, let's 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 let it fly. Let's roll. So let's uh one hey really happy to to be part of this because uh pretty exciting. Wish we were in person, but we're not. But because we're not, we can touch a lot of folks across the globe right now. So fantastic. And what I'd like to share with you today uh, is highlight uh, this idea of uh, DRSP DSRP. I did that on purpose, Derek, just for you. Just so you know, so you may think it's a typo. It is not seeing if anyone is paying attention. All right. And system engineering uh, and how it's leveraged in the Army and also how you might think about uh, our current environment operating in the current new normal. And then how this is a the same idea is applied in the military and also baked in already in how we operate in the Army and beyond. So I'm gonna describe quickly the new normal that as, as Laura and Derek and many of us know is just the normal. I'm gonna highlight this idea of system thinking, which we all kind of know. Uh, and then how do you lead in this new normal, leveraging these ideas and, ha and a handful of takeaways that you can walk away with that is baked into extending this idea uh, and how I've applied DSRP in the other frameworks that I've created over the past year or so. And so let, let's, let's go back in the way back machine to 2019 when we started hearing the bubbling about this thing and this picture meant nothing to us. These spike thingies meant nothing to us. Then all of a sudden over the last two years, uh, it was like a really bad I Am Legend movie and trying to see, you know, this, how does everything shut down? This is not a real thing, but we've all experienced it. Uh, and so COVID-19 is a thing, uh, which meant around March, at least in the US and across the globe, we saw this happen because everything was awesome until March when the NBA stopped playing and we realized COVID was a real thing. Uh, and all our kids started going home for those of us who had kids. And then we actually saw the world simultaneously shut down. Um, and so we're all interconnected. We always knew that. We always knew the world was kind of flat based on the internet. But then we realized the world really was flat in a way that none of us could imagine. Uh, and it also unlocked a lot of inequalities and equities and really made wicked problems 
worse, which for those of us who like to call ourselves problem solvers, awesome, because all of these challenges create great opportunities for us to engage to really help our, our fellow citizens, our global citizens in ways uh, we might not have been able to do before. And, and uh, as, as some of my colleagues might say, you, you don't want to waste a good crisis. So, you know, we're able now to leverage our intellectual capacity, our intellectual institutions in ways we might not have if it had it not been for the past couple of years. And so now we get to this new normal. And so, uh, and actually I wrote about this at the beginning of the pandemic, this idea of how are you gonna operate in this new normal? Because there's so many of us who really wanna go back to 2019, but the genie's out of the bottle. The way in which we operate, the way in which we recognize we're interconnected, the way in which we recognize uh, new areas. I mean, DoorDash, who could care about something like that? I'm not gonna pay some random person to go to McDonald's to pick up food for me, but my kids do it all the time. So there's new economies that have been created just by operating and adapting to the current environment. Uh, because the, the world we live in is, uh, is pretty VUCA. And it, there's an H there, Derek, it's not a typo, okay? So meaning the world we're operating in in this new normal has always been volatile. But COVID-19 in the past two years has amplified the volatility in ways we can anticipate which means that we're operating in a very uncertain time. So uh, as, as an engineer, you kind of want to have certainty and be very linear in how we think about things or at least networked, doesn't much matter. Everything's pretty uncertain, but this is the world we live in. And it's very complex, which means it creates problems that are ambiguous. And because of the internet, because that we're all, the world is flat, not because you know we believe that geography is flat, it's flat because I can pick up the phone right now and, I, and someone on this who's a participant might be sitting in China, on the continent, in Europe, in South America, in Central America, in California right now. We're hyper-connected, which makes this new normal even more volatile, even more uncertain, even more complex, even more ambiguous. VUCA comes from the military. It's, it's a way in which it allows us to kind of frame and bring some kind of order to chaos because we acknowledge the world as it is not as we wished it would be. And then we create frameworks that allow us to operate because we have to learn how to thrive in it. And that's where this, this whole idea of like taking a systems approach kind of allows us as we put frame and structure around the gray, well, we gotta have a way to start. And that's something that as we think about this idea of how system of thinking may apply in the army, it also helps enable us to create future leaders, which are then expected to provide order to chaos. And what I mean by that is that, in, at least in the, the, U, the U.S. military specifically, um, the, these frameworks allow us to drop a person or a number of people on any place in the planet and allows them to be able to operate in this VUCA environment. Uh, and it allows us to create thinkers who are strategic, operational, and tactical. And so as I think about if we, and a lot of us believe we understand these different ideas, right? And so, but let's say strategic. I'll call strategic folks or strategic thinkers, big thinkers, big idea people. They're fantastic. They're amazing. We got to have it. Tactical folks on the other end are the doers. They get things done. The challenge is that operational lens in the middle. How do we create individuals who can have the mental cognitive capacity to operationalize the big ideas in order for others to do tactical things? And that's where leveraging system thinking allows the link between the big ideas and the implementation it, that's very powerful that at least in the US military in the way in which we design and have frameworks is actually baked in. We just never called it systems thinking. And then we like ran across Derek and say, hey, we do that, but I like your words better because it's simpler and it helps us really codify things that we're already doing and makes it more sticky. So again, strategic, big idea people, love them, gotta have them. 
tactical, you need doers. But what I see and I've seen in my own military career, what I've seen as an educator in teaching system engineering, systems thinking ideas and mental models allow us to traverse and move through and connect the big ideas to how we get things done. And an example of this. Okay. And so uh, I'm going to just share a couple of stories to connect where this goes. And so if we look at this picture, this is from Desert Storm 1, 1991. And so what does that really mean? We had, to, we had a, a mental model of the world in 1991 where we had built up a force post-Vietnam War. We had created an army to do anything. And we were, our adversary uh, at the time we thought we're just going to be the Russians until this random dude in, uh, in Iraq decided to attack our friends called invade our friends in Kuwait and all of a sudden pulled us into the Middle East the first time. We'd already been there before, but we don't talk about that very much. So, but in, in 1991, we roll in, 100 hours later, we're done, we're winning, we're amazing. The world is calm, everything's peaceful. We think there's no issues. That's our mental model. Everything's good. Russians, uh, the USSR is broken up. We have no competitors. We're the one big, big dog uh, in the world. So we thought. But then we start to transition. Our mental models have to adjust because in the 90s, uh, as we draw down the force in the US, we lose 200,000 soldiers in less than 24 months. We start to engage in peacekeeping operations. So our mental model has to quickly adjust and change because we have to create a presence across the globe in the Balkans and in other spaces and places because now we're just trying to maintain stability. That's a very different mental model than going against Iraq in 1991. And then if we jump 10 years from 91 to 9-11, we weren't prepared for this. On September 10th, everything's good. We're doing peacekeeping. September 11th, we wake up, we have all of a sudden the world is different and our mental model has to change. We have to adjust and we have to adapt. And it takes a moment, nothing happens. The world, the way in which we operate can't pivot on a dime. And so the effect, of, if we think about it from a systems thinking perspective, we have Operation Desert Storm is our, is our initial mental model. 9-11 happens and we have to change because now we're fighting on horses horseback in Afghanistan. Those are very different conflicting realities. And, and each time we're going through an adjustment and riding on horses is not driving tanks in the desert. The perspective of operating on horseback versus operating in large scale combat is not the same. The system in which we maneuver across the globe has to be very different and recognizing recognize the perspective. We're dealing with a tribal group in Afghanistan versus an actual army competitor in Iraq. Those are very contrasting realities and we have to quickly adapt and adjust our mental models quickly in order to operate and simultaneously operate in Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. In a way in which we do that is we adjust our mental model by creating the doctrine necessary. So again, the DSRP model of systems thinking is baked into how we do doctrine because we recognize what is and what is not. We understand that in order to do large scale operations, we have to think about what we want to do, defeat the enemy, provide national security, and break that down into different parts based on formations and then recognize the perspective of European partners versus Middle Eastern partners versus, you know, the far, uh, our, our Asian partners. And so all of it's already baked in how we operate so that now, as you saw before, it's not just Iraq or Afghanistan, it just kind of is both simultaneously. Because the world, if we think about what uh, China was doing in the, as we're in this, evolving state of combat in two spaces, China's doing building new, <laughs> new islands and pushing out a perimeter. We're dealing with issues in North Korea. Brexit happened over the last five years. 
uh, and then issues with Russia, uh, which that we're dealing with like in the world right now. And oh, by the way, we can't forget about Syria. And so the effect of leveraging DSRP allows us a framework that connects our very large scale big ideas, our very tactical realities of maneuvering units across the globe, and the doctrine is what connects us. But again, the DSRP model, systems thinking, uh, again, uh, is already baked into how we operate within the, in the US military because we're in a constant global conflict. And that's our VUCA world. This is kind of what it is. And we have to have leaders who are cognitively capable of thinking through the complexities of these multiple problems at the same time. Uh, and one and one of those that comes out, out of this is we have this idea of unified land operations, and now we call it something else. But the reality is this picture kind of highlights the way in which we fight, which is not just a bunch of tanks on the desert floor in 1991. It's a various with uh, unmanned devices, uh, space, ships. And so there's a lot going on in this very complex VUCA world. And we have to have leaders able to operate not only in mega cities, but in the littorals close to the coast in order to function and operate and break down problems quickly because we may have folks distributed across an area operating independently and interdependently at the same time. And so again, just highlighting a, a VUCA world. And then let's go back to the classroom. How might one develop someone who can operate this way? Well, one way, at least at the US Military Academy, when I was in charge of the core engineering sequence, was thinking through how do we introduce this idea of system engineering? And one of the frameworks in which was a foundational developmental element was systems thinking, defining what it is, leveraging the DSRP model as a foundational tool to connect throughout the arc of our curriculum, because on the other end, we need leaders who can uh, think through modeling, who can understand different decision-making tools, understand tra trade space, and then integrate our overarching system decision, uh, system de uh, decision process in order to then do a real project. Again, all very academic, but, in, in, but with all of this foundational elements, then capstone with a real client it, to integrate and uh, bring in all that they've learned in a very structured way over the arc of their uh, academic careers within the system engineering department. Again, at, at U US Military Academy, everyone's an engineer, it's kind of required. So whether you're taking system engineering, nuclear engineering, double E, electrical, mechanical, a similar process happens in the other engineering sequences. But we, at least we believe that based on what we receive from our graduates as far as what's helps them the most is this idea of systems thinking. Because you can wrap your head around it, you can understand it, and it can be applied across multiple disciplines. And in other ways in which it shows up, uh, as uh, Laura said, I was a helicopter pilot. I, I'm actually probably flying in a helicopter right now. Just kidding. But that is a picture of me. You just can't see me. Um, and so the way in which we communicate is kind of like this. And if we look at this basic troop leading procedure, this is a process that is just normally used within the military. It's pretty basic. But if you look at each of the elements, yeah, it's seven steps. But it's basic DSRP in a linear way. And then if you translate that those steps and look at the picture, everything on that picture means something. As a helicopter pilot, as a person who understands operations, I'm looking at this picture and know I'm moving a battalion or 300 people. I know I have a command and control aircraft above me. I understand I have Apache helicopters on call and I'm operating my mission where we're gonna be based on the location and positions of all of, all of the folks. So I have an initial mental model of how we're gonna do this operation. And then the world is gonna give me feedback the moment I take off from the airfield and I may have to adjust. 
And I can tell you based on real experience in combat, out of combat, and this bebop around North Carolina, the world changes quickly. You have to adapt, especially when you have 10 to 15 helicopters in the air at the same time with people in the back and other, other uh, uh, assets all around you. You have to be able to visualize the world in which you're in quickly from the seat of a helicopter at night. It's not, it's, it's, it's hard, but not impossible. And, and another way in which, at least in the academic way, we kind of integrate and think about uh, systems thinking is in this way. And so it's a, you can see a multiple concentric circles. And this is, as you look at this, this picture, this is our system decision process that we leverage at West Point because we have to understand our stakeholders, our value propositions, our functional analysis, and then we kind of build out. But we have to understand where everything integrates, which is really important because we believe that by designing our curriculum in this way, we can create the critical thinkers necessary. We have mastery uh, and our interdisciplinary thinkers and can actually pull in everything they've learned throughout their academic careers because at the U.S. Military Academy, you have a requirement for mathematics and science and liberal arts, and you have to be able to integrate. As we all know, as students, when we're going through it, we believe everything is mutually exclusive. Everything's very siloed. There's actually an integration of the curriculum that we kind of bring to bear by introducing students to the DSRP method. And so I'd like to share with you another way in which we, which I have uh, thought about operationalizing uh, leading in the new normal that's heavily weighted towards leaders. So again, let's not lose DSRP, but now we're leading, leading in this new normal. And there's another way in which I, I kind of break down what, what needs to happen. And everything's, I believe everything's a process. I can break everything into parts. And so how are you gonna lead a new normal? Well, if I break it down into this lead framework, which built off of my DSRP, I have to leverage different platforms come in a hybrid environment. I have to engage in every situation because the world is VUCA. You have to lean in as a leader. You can't just sit on the sidelines. Leadership is a contact sport. And if you don't lean in, then you can't manage teams or organizations in a meaningful way. We all believe we're adaptive, but are we really? And so one area as I, as I teach operations that is sometimes there's an oversight is recognizing the people part and helping people adapt and train and train people to be proficient, not to do training to time. That's a very military thing. We train to time, uh, not to proficiency, but that's, we have to, we've had to change that, that idea because that does not create the human capital necessary to operate in the VUCA environment that we're in. And then the most important thing for, for leaders and, and which is again, supported by systems thinking is distilling information to the most important points. Critically understanding what mental model, where are you and thinking about where you might be based on how you visualize the environment, which is a very leader centric thing because people wanna understand why they're doing things. But if you as a leader don't distill information, you can't get there from here. And, uh, which kind of goes into this idea of uh, commander's intent. This commander's intent uh, idea is what we use in the military to move 1.2 million people uh, the same way every day around the globe. But it's basically just DSRP. That's really all it is. Because the structure around commander's intent is the why, the what, and how you want things to end. Pretty basic. Why are you doing something? What I need to get done and how I want it to end. The easiest example of this is, uh, Derek, do you know what picture this is? I cold called you just then on purpose. Yeah, uh, that, that's in World War II and that is uh, Eisenhower. Uh, Speaks I'll of the I mean, in France. You know, yeah, we, we could have went sideways, but yes, that is Eisenhower before the Normandy invasion, just before. And so- No, it's not in France, it's in England. Is in England before yeah. before they go, and most people don't know that uh, the Normandy invasion was delayed two days because of weather, and everyone understood what had to get done. And here here's the Normandy invasion in like thirty seconds or less. 
You put a bunch of people on the back of planes, they fly across the, the channel, they jump out of planes, they hit the ground, they're dispersed, they walk west to take out German guns to create an avenue for an amphibious assault. That's, that's Normandy. What actually happened, you had a bunch of planes get shot down all over the place. You had a bunch of random soldiers distributed across France, different units, they come together because they understood the intent to take out the German guns, they could find each other, move together, meet the mission in order for us to then move and you know create a beachhead. But everyone had to understand what was going on. Very basic situation, no Facebook, no Twitter, no Slack, no internet, but they were able to do it and maneuver and everyone understood what they had to do. They had a mental model of what was required in order to create success and win. That's the power of the DSRP method. Again, it's kind of baked in to everything I've learned in 25 years of being in the military and a lot of educational schools. Uh, and if I unpack military history, you can find it distributed throughout. Even if we go all the way back to Clausewitz and Napoleon, you can find it there because that's where commander's intent comes from. And so this is kind of where we are. The environment we're operating in, this book environment, this remote environment, this hybrid environment, requires a lot more, a uh, lot more on the leader than it requires an active engagement. A way in which leaders can better be uh, prepared is by thinking through, taking a system approach to things, by understanding uh, what is is and what is not, breaking down things by parts, recognizing relationships, and acknowledging that maybe. Each of us have a different perspective. Either we as people, we as teams, at echelon within organizations. And so right now I'm open for any questions or, uh, or can answer anything that someone may have until uh, Laura gives me the hook and tell me that I'm done. I'll stop sharing. All right. Um, that was great, Heist. Thank you. Um, I, I, I loved your, your point about, uh, that we're all connect interconnected, but COVID actually kind of showed it to us every day in a very tangible way. And the, uh, VUCA H was really in many ways, just lurking beneath the surface. And then, and VUCA just kind of like brought it to the surface, but it was there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it's now forced everybody worldwide to sort of accept the reality of VUCA, uh, uh, whether you use that word or not, but to, to accept that reality. It's a great point. So um, lots of questions here. So uh, first one is, and you can always tell the military because they start with sir. Uh, sir, could you speak to how information operations or MISO might be seen as a system DSRP model and potential value for both shaping and mitigation prevention? Well, I think that's a, a great question. I think if we're honest, um, even though we joke about it, uh, Intel drives maneuver and information is the it's kind of king. And so uh, as we continue to train, we're, we're being more conscious around how important that aspect uh, of our, our aspect and capability that is, and we're getting better at understanding how to leverage it. That, I mean, that's a, a personal thing. If we're honest, within a military formation, you may have three generations sitting there. You know, like the old folks who are, you know, like 20 years seeing to the, the, the youngest people and an understanding of operations, although we, we get it in our, in our education over time, there's just gaps. And so we have to, you have to create leaders who are open to recognizing the power of, of MISO operations. And so I think, uh, I think that's becoming well established as we, as is implemented more and more in training centers in a way it wasn't even just seven years ago. Uh, really insightful, thank you. Uh, can you explain what you mean by quote, adapt to train to proficiency, not to time, unquote. <laughs> Easy. So if we think about it, I'll, I'll do corporate for that. So if we think about how many times have you been in a corporate situation where you just have to like check the box and do some training? 
we all have to do cyber training, right? I'm sure we do. It's not just the Department of Defense. It's not just our universities. So you don't have to be proficient to click through all of the trainings in which you do, whether you in, or click through all of the, the courses you deal with. That's not necessarily proficient, okay? So, however, when you really get good at something, you're gonna constantly train to get good at it. So for instance, flying a helicopter, uh, the, their standard timing in which I had to, had to fly based on the Army's assessment that I'm safe. But, I, but come out of Fort Rucker, Alabama, where I learned how to fly helicopters to South Korea, which was my first assignment, I showed the South Korea and I was pretty dangerous. I was trained uh, to time, not to be proficient. And it took another six to eight months before I was given the keys to the car and my car was a $10 million Blackhawk flying on a demilitarized zone. So, but it took that long to get me proficient in the, in the space in order to have, be given the responsibility of that kind of a platform to do the missions I was doing. That's an expensive car. That is an expensive car, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> that is a pretty cool car. Um, Here's one for you. Uh, in Derek's opening talk, he discussed agency as being simple rules distributed across the individual agents producing the coordinated behavior. Mm. With Ukraine, we've heard about the UA having a developed NCO core, mm -hmm. which Russia does not have. Can you make explicit how DSRP leads to agency in the NCO core, if it does, uh, sorry, no, you were focused on COs, not NCOs, but same principles hopefully apply. And, and if you use acronyms for the non-military folks, just, yeah. just uh, detail what those acronyms are. And, and so just for context, in the, in the, in the U.S. military, there's um, commissions officers and, and non-commissioned officers. So a commissioned officer is someone who, let's say, is like middle man management, okay, or like middle to upper management. The NCOs actually, the non-commissioned officers actually get things done. So that's kind of how we look at it. And so uh, the DSRP method has got already baked in also how our non-commissioned officer core leads because if we think about the structure of any organization, there's a, the officer, there's a non-commissioned officer who's just, who is the officer's partner, and then all the people who actually do stuff. Well, the officer creates the strategy and, and has to operationalize that strategy in a way in which the non-commissioned officer can then implement with the team. So the DSRP method is already baked into our processes and how we even communicate, even down to the basic troop leading procedures that I showed before, that's at the low, troop leading procedures are normally used at the, what is known at the platoon level. So that's the low, lowest unit level that's around 30 to 50 people. And then one officer is part of that and six non-commissioned officers are part of that. So it's almost like the, the, C, the VP person with the director person, if you look in corporate structures, uh, are getting things done uh, in that way. The same principles apply. And, and going back, to the reason why we, we, we hinge on the non-commissioned officer core versus, uh, versus what maybe our, our uh, adversaries have is because our non-commissioned officer core is trained to exercise discipline initiative uh, when able. So if they're operating alone, not afraid somewhere, they understand their leader's intent and have the license and agency to meet the mission without having to ask for permission. All right. So um, there's one. This one's uh, from, from me. Uh, uh, systems engineers learn a lot of technical modeling and analysis and are trained in a number of tools and techniques as you showed in your uh, curricular slide. But what we know is that a, a system tool in the hands of a non-systems thinker doesn't really produce systems results. So you might think of this as kind of carpentry tools versus the mindset of the carpenter. Can you say a bit more about how, how that pl plays out, that, like the tools versus the mindset? Uh, because we can we can train people in you know, network theory or ABM or, or any of these uh, techniques. And if they're not thinking systemically, those tools really don't end up being systemic. I think that's a great question. I think the way in which the, 
to bridge that is through um, placing people in a crisis situation, be it real or creating a pseudo crisis. Mm -hmm. And by creating the crisis, it really putting people in a pressure situation creates the need to understand the tools better. It provides uh, those leaders who are observing, understanding whether you actually know what you're doing, and then actually highlights the gaps and where you need to focus to help someone bridge. Because you're right, I can, I can have an awesome tool, but I don't really understand how to use it. It's kind of pointless. It's kind of like a brick. It's similar to, uh, I think I had, a, I had a colleague ask me, why don't we send airplanes to a random country? And I said, uh, well, I can send a plane, but if I don't have fuel, if I don't have a mechanic, if I don't have tools <laughs> or supply chain, the plane can't really do much. So just throwing it out there, something to consider. Um, however, in order to uh, really infuse the mindset, you, in my opinion, and based on experience, you have to place people in the most realistic training you possibly can, or a lot of tabletop drills where you can at least enforce you to play like a game of risk yeah. and so you can understand someone's mindset and then really poke at, well, why are you not using this? Or what about this capability or that capability? Or why are you not considering X? It really forces that dialogue and really the same endorphins you kind of get when you're on the field, you can actually mimic in, yeah. a, in an actual simulation or on a tabletop drill in discussions. Well, we're seeing that uh, we're seeing that plane example right now in the Ukraine, right? With Russian, I mean, they sent a bunch of tanks, but they didn't have the logistics. Exactly. Which is just systems and systems in place to support those tanks. And, and so, yeah. Um, this one, uh, let's see. How could we use DSRP or systems thinking to change the driver for an army? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, or stop unknowingly creating enemies, but knowingly creating friends? That's a complex question and I'm kind of confused. Um, just so you know, uh, let's see here. Uh, because we unknowingly create enemies all the time. There's like a second, third order effects, no matter where you go. So if we, if it's similar to, um, we never know if we, um, if we are upsetting someone until someone that tells us, right? We, uh, you, know, you know, I'm really sorry that I really rubbed you the wrong way. I had no idea. So, um, so I'm not for sure uh, how to answer that question, to be honest. Okay. What were the major challenges you found in integrating systems thinking into a command and control environment where you need your people to think in that flexible way, but still within orders, instructions, asking yeah, from a law enforcement position? Okay, uh, with, that's great because I, I literally just gave a talk to some law enforcement officials not too long ago. And so, and, would you, and they operate in a very controlled, command and control environment. However, uh, within law enforcement, uh, there's also an opportunity to really create training because they can train similar to the military, but they have to, the leaders have to be comfortable with empowering down. And so even in a very highly regulated industry, there are opp opportunities to exercise what I would call a discipline initiative in the gray. And that's where DSRP can be helpful because we're honest, especially in law enforcement, you have individuals operating by themselves or with teams alone and unafraid in sectors and places. And they have, to, they have to make a lot of key decisions on the fly while understanding all the rules. And so I, I think there's ways to, to do that. And again, and every, every time I've gone to combat, I've normally gone through multiple training center and large exercises beforehand, which allows me to understand who, who, uh, who do I trust with that kind of agency and who I do not trust with that kind of agency, which allows us to focus where we need to shore up our, our issues. Excellent. I think we have uh, maybe a couple more we can do. Uh, this one says, thank you for your, uh, very much for your service. What has your experience been in successfully teaching and coaching the multi-level situational awareness needed to think in systems in either military or business environment, parentheses, tactical, operational, and strategic while moving quickly between the three? What's interesting is that most- wrote a paper on that. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think most people believe they're strategic when they're actually operating in a very tactical way. So just because we say something in a strategy does not mean it's strategic. Although there are many <clears throat> executives and many organizations who believe they're strategic when they're actually focused on the end product or the, or the last mile. And so it's almost helping them recognize and, and elevate their thought process through introducing frameworks that force that elevation and then highlighting where you can bake in and bridge that operational and tactical portion and then highlighting who needs to be where. Everyone can't be strategic. Uh, the majority of people are actually tactical, but someone has to be thinking about what's over the mountain. And so uh, I found through forcing conversations, ask a lot of questions and really um, visually showing uh, the different activities highlights quickly where they're actually focused. And you can also look at you know, someone's balance sheet, where are you putting all your, your resources? That kind of highlights where you're focused. Okay, uh, this one, uh, let's see. Sir, a follow-up on the train to proficiency question. What are the, a few tools and tips uh, would you advise to implement in an organization to help achieve that, especially when the org is focused on time? Well, I, I think, well, that's a great question. I think it's more around what is, your, what is your organizational rhythm? Meaning, how do you communicate? How do you force feedback? How do you implement feedback? How do you, do you actually do after action reviews or any kind of follow-up? And is it codified somewhere? So, I mean, this is very basic, but it's the most basic block and tackling that I've, I've found to be the most difficult for organizations to do. And so, at least in, in, a, in an army context, we have operations orders where we, we introduce information. We force immediate uh, confirmation briefs on what, I just heard, what you just heard. We force formal back briefs, meaning have you think about what's your role in having leaders share in an open forum what they think to in, engage a leader to decide. And then we force after action reviews that are actually led by not the organization, by an uninterested actor in order to not get all in your feelings about things. And so are you doing that? And it can be done in a very agile way, but these activities reinforce can help you get after what you're describing. Thank you, Heiss. Dr. Gibson, uh, uh, thank you very much. Great talk and uh, really, really appreciated it. Um, we're going to do a, a quick five or six minute wrap up and um, and then we'll be done. So Laura's going to join me here. Look at that. It's like magic. It's like magic. <laughs> it's like magic. Uh, and, <laughs> and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to engage this team and thank you for inviting me. Uh, and I'm going to jump back to uh, the, the real world and uh, engage in Shreveport, Louisiana. Nice. That's good. Have fun. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.